Hello, my name is Daniel Martin Gonzalez and I will be presenting today Connectionism System and Dynamic Systems Theory as an as innovative EFL teaching methodologies. So first of all, these are the contents that I will be presenting today. I will be dealing with Connectionism, Dynamic Systems Theory and different innovation and applications for these two models. Um, first of all, as theories and models for second language acquisition are still growing, the ongoing debate about how languages are acquired continues. However, there is a theory that is gaining ground, not only in psycholinguistics, but in other models of second language acquisition, which is connectionism. Um, but it was until recently, it was not until recently that connectionism was studied uh, to try to understand the implications for language acquisition and also for language teaching. Um, connectionism is linked to different theories that you can see in this table, to behaviorism. That was the beginning of the old connectionism, the one that was uh, postulated by Thorndike in the Law of Effect in 1905, uh, whereby learning was explained in terms of strengthening or weakening of connections between stimuli and response. Uh, Thorndike believed that the weight of the connections is the outcome of the satisfaction obtained from the response. In other words, a child would learn a language structure because the father or mother would reward such structure. And that will lead, of course, to operant conditioning and skinner, right? Connectionism is also linked to artificial intelligence with Rammelhart, which was the main proponent of connection, connectionism with some other colleagues. Then connectionism is also linked to nativism because it's, it is totally the opposite, as we would expect, because uh, connectionism is normally linked to operant conditioning, right? And finally, to competition model by Mike Whitney. Um, according to this theory, there are different cues that compete at the same time in order to process information. That is the case of word order, agreement, case, and animacy. So for instance, if you have the sentence, George has come with his baby dogs at home, in order to identify the subject, different cues are competing in the brain, right? Uh, like word order and agreement, case and animacy. And all of them have um, a cue that leads the person into thinking, oh, so George is going to be the subject. So this is important um, for language processing, right? Also, connectionism has different approaches, and depending on the approach, you would have um, different studies. So when it is used in psycholinguistics, normally uh, people would be dealing not just with language acquisition, as we're talking here, and language teaching, but also with speech recognition, reading, speech production. Then for cognitive aspects, uh, people deal with the met metaphor of the computer, right? Because as you see, Connectionism is normally linked to artificial intelligence, uh, to cognitive phenomena, and also for computational matters. Here, what you can see is actually um, different figures that summarize what connectionism is all about. Connectionism is a mathematical model based on different algorithms. All those algorithms occur in the hidden units, which is the second phase. So first we have some input, like in linguistics, right? Then that goes to the hidden units. In the hidden units, different algorithms process the information and produce an outcome, right? Like an output. Okay. Um, one of the most famous algorithms is the backpropagation algorithm, which is a supervised learning algorithm. Uh, for instance, just for, for me to explain this, you have the sentence, uh, he likes chocolate. It should be likes, right? And sometimes you spend a lot of time explaining this to students in a B1 course, right? And they seem to understand. They seem to understand what the structure is all about. However, when they actually wanna use it and apply it in their spontaneous talks, they don't seem to use it, right? So that is a common case. It also happens in A2 and, and so on. So for connectionism, this has some sort of explanation. 
and that is with the concept of error. Errors are very important for connectionism. And we need to understand that in connectionism, there is the desired outcome, for instance, he likes, and what I actually say, for instance, he like, right? So an error is the difference between those two. And in connectionism, different algorithms will occur in the hidden units until you actually process this. And for this to happen, you need iteration. So you need to repeat the same structure, but not like brain, right? But in a spontaneous talks, you need to commit a lot of mistakes in order to finally get the structure correct, right? Okay. Um, connectionism, which is a computational model, tries to emulate um, some biological processing of the information. So at the end, uh, the desired output for connectionism is trying to explain sub synapses and how learning actually occurs in the brain, but using computers, right? Then what is dynamic systems theory? So this theory is uh, very much linked to connectionism. It explains that the world is a system uh, and it is subdivided into different systems, right? Uh, so in the case of the language system, language is not just rules, but it has a vast array of different meaningful units intertwined that interact. Sound, morphemes, semantic items, and so on, right? Pragmatics. Uh, language development is not linear. It is actually dynamic. And that is why dynamic systems theory conceives uh, language learning as language development. And it is totally opposed to language acquisition as if, as if language could be a product that you can actually acquire. Actually, language is some sort of development through years, uh, through decades, right? Um, so coming back to the linguistic um, aspect, language can self-organize itself through iteration of forming in pairs. The more a unit is heard and used, the more entrenched it becomes. This functional approach to language assumes that lexicon and grammar form a continuum, like in Halliday model, right? Therefore, meaning in sounds, intonation, words, or grammatical patterns is the core of this model. Students must be exposed to authentic samples of language through meaningful context exchanges in which students can identify the social functions underlying linguistic forms. As mentioned before, different subsystems will be competing in the learner's brain. So the teacher must direct the focus of what is being taught to the right di direction. For instance, in a listening activity, students can actually pay attention to so many different linguistic aspects like speed, rhythm, lexis, grammatical structure, just vocabulary, and so on, right? So it is up to the teacher to decide what he or she wants to teach and what wants to pay their uh, attention to. Okay, here you see some applications of connectionism in the 1980s when it all started. Um, so it was mainly used to visual word recognition and semantics, spoken word recognition and so on. And here I'm going to show you an example of connectionism into practice with the program Gallito 2.0 by UNED. As we mentioned, connectionism is a model based on statistical phenomena rather than just language rules. The output layer produces outcomes learned from the input that you have received, right? So statistical representations of word knowledge are important. The statistical corpus-based representations of meaning are somewhat simple. Nevertheless, powerful estimates of the extent to which students' responses reflect key constructs and expectations. Uh, so applying this model based on latent semantic analysis uh, to provide immediate feedback to students writing long essays can be quite interesting. So in Gallito 2.0, students have like different rubrics, uh, access that they mentioned here, that they need to pay attention to. And they write whatever text, and that text will be shown here in the graphic by showing the difference of the desired output and what the student has actually said. 
So it's a nice uh, way to bring such a theoretical component as connectionism into the pitching arena, right? But I think that connectionism and dynamic systems theory have a lot of applications and implications, but more than anything, implications, right? So they have a lot of didactic implications like errors and order of acquisition. Normally courses in primary school, secondary school, tend to be based on uh, continuous assessment. And this makes a lot of sense for connectionism. So we can frame continuous assessment on the idea of connectionism. Uh, we have here the U-shaped course of development. So first of all, you teach a student, let's say a grammatical instruction that the student seems to get. But then after some point, you realize that the person has forgotten something or he or she is not doing it well. Okay, it's fine. Uh, it will probably uh, be self-corrected in a few months by means of committing the same mistake again and again, the brain will rearrange um, this information, right? So as in behaviorist models of knowledge, learning actually is dependent on iteration, but not just, so to say, learning grammar by drills, but it is actually a case of speaking spontaneously and see what the result is and then matching the what you actually say to the desired output and by tons, hundreds, sometimes thousands of iterations, uh, the brain readjusts itself and it will correct this. So what I, what I have shown here is the way connectionism and dynamic systems theory um, are a combination of neurolinguistics, psycholinguistics, linguistics, and so on. Um, and they are very theoretical. It's, it's like a limitation of, of these models. They are very theoretical, but they can actually um, be expanded onto different educational problems. Um, and they can actually reframe our, our conception of foreign language acquisition.